The U.S. Treasury Secretary warned earlier this week that the U.S. government will run out of money by June 1st if the debt ceiling is not raised by then. The warning came after data show that federal tax receipts in April came in much lower than expected. With time running out, President Biden has finally agreed to meet with the Speaker Kevin McCarthy on May 9th to begin negotiation. Is anything going to come out of this meeting? Will the compromise be found to avert a default? Who is going to blink first? How serious are the U.S. fiscal and debt problems compared to allies like the U.K., Canada, and rivals like China and Russia? Why is the debt ceiling the only thing that can save the U.S. dollar hegemon? I'm David Wu, a former IMF economist and Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about major global change. Welcome to David Wu Unbound, where I take on groupthink, propaganda, and conspiracy theories in my critical analysis of markets, economics, and politics. The last four years have witnessed an unprecedented increase in government debt around the world. First was the pandemic, then came the Ukraine war. But the fiscal effects of these two events vary greatly across countries. Governments responded to the pandemic by boosting spending and cutting taxes, but some countries did it more aggressively than others. Likewise, the Ukraine war has had very different impact on the fiscal positions of different countries. In general, oil importers, especially those that join in with the US-led sanctions against Russia, like Germany, UK, and Japan, resorted to generous handouts to counter the energy price spike. In contrast, the fiscal positions of oil importers that did not join in the sanctions, like China and India, were less affected by the war. Between 2019 and 2022, the 12 countries that belong either to the G7 club or the BRICS group saw their general government debt to GDP ratio increase by an average of 12 percentage points. Japan led the group, with its general government debt rising by nearly 25 percentage points of GDP. Not too far behind came the UK, China, Canada, and South Africa. These countries saw their general government debt to GDP ratio increase by between 15 to 18 percentage points during those four years. Among advanced economies, the US did not do too badly, with its general government debt to GDP ratio rising by 13 percentage points. This may be somewhat surprising given US fiscal loosening was more aggressive than what we saw in other countries. But the more aggressive American response also brought about a faster economic recovery, especially given e-commerce was better established in the U.S. than elsewhere before the pandemic. The U.S. being energy self-sufficient was also less affected by the Ukraine war than Europe and Japan. On the whole, developing countries, with the notable exception of China, did better than advanced economies. Brazil was the only economy in our country grouping that saw its general government debt to GDP ratio fall during the period. Russia also came out with barely more debt. So is the case with India. This mostly reflects the fact that the fiscal response to the pandemic in many developing countries was more modest than what we saw among the advanced economies. This was sometimes due to policy choice and sometimes dictated by the greater borrowing constraints faced by developing countries. Whatever was the reason, this will strengthen their long-term competitiveness relative to the advanced economies. With the exception of Germany, the general government debt to GDP ratios of the largest economies in the world are all currently at their all-time high. Japan, of course, is in a league of its own. Its general government debt to GDP ratio is now at 260%. In a distant second place is Italy, whose general government debt to GDP ratio is at 140%. The US is firmly in third place at 122% of GDP. After that come France, Canada, and the UK. Before the pandemic, Brazil had the highest debt to GDP ratio among the BRICS group. It still does, but the gap has narrowed. In particular, China, whose debt to GDP ratio was only higher than Russia's among the BRICS group as late as 2015, is fast catching up. The IMF projects that by 2026, China's general government debt to GDP ratio will be the highest among the BRICS. Germany and Russia can boast of enjoying the strongest fiscal positions among the largest economies in the world. In the case of Russia, its general government debt to GDP ratio was barely 20% of GDP at the end of 2022. Even with the fiscal deterioration as the result of the war, 
The IMF projects that its general government debt to GDP ratio will go up to 25% of GDP at the end of this year. That is less than 20% of that of the US. What does high debt burden mean for the world economy and the global financial markets? What Japan has taught us is that racking up a lot of debt is not a problem when deflation rules. The reason why Japan could carry such a huge debt burden for so long is because deflation has allowed the Bank of Japan to keep both short-term and long-term interest rates at zero indefinitely. When you can borrow at zero interest rates, you never have to really worry about not being able to service your debt. The problem with the huge increase in government debt over the past four years is that inflation has gone up too. High inflation has meant that not only nominal interest rates have gone up, but more importantly, real interest rates have gone up too. This is not just for new borrowing, but for rolling over maturing debt. In the case of the US, the annualized interest payments on US federal government debt hit $928 billion in the first quarter. That represents an 80% increase over the past three years. It is now bigger than the spending on defense, bigger than even Medicare. Debt sustainability of any country relies on two important considerations. One, whether real interest rates are higher or lower than real GDP growth. Two, whether the country is running a primary surplus or deficit, primary balance being the fiscal position net of interest payments. When real interest rates are higher than real GDP growth, then the country has to run a primary surplus to prevent its debt from exploding. Today is widely accepted that globalization drove down inflation, inflation risk premium, and interest rates. With globalization now in reverse gear, it is now a given that real interest rates will be higher over the next 10 years than the last 10 years. It is not inconceivable that real interest rates will even exceed real GDP growth at times. Against this backdrop, the so-called cyclically adjusted primary balance will likely grow in importance for both credit rating agencies and the bond market alike. Primary balance just means fiscal balance net of interest payments. Cyclically adjusted means that we're just focusing on the underlying structural fiscal position. Countries with stronger primary balances will be viewed as being in a stronger position to cope with a structural increase in real interest rates. So how do our 12 members of the G7 and BRICS rank relative to each other in terms of their cyclically adjusted primary balance? For 2023, Japan is projected by the IMF to have the highest cyclically adjusted primary deficit among the largest economies in the world, at 6.2% of potential GDP. Next come Russia and China, at 5.5% and 5.3% respectively. The US is immediately behind at 4.1% of GDP. Then come India, UK and France at between 3 and 3.6%. Germany and Brazil come next at 2.5 and 2%. South Africa and Canada are projected to run a small primary deficit, while Italy will go into a surplus. If the US has one of the highest general government debt to GDP ratios in the world, it is in large part because the US, as the issuer of the world's reserve currency, faces almost no borrowing constraint. Put differently, the insatiable demand for US dollar and US debt from the rest of the world has been feeding America's spend now and pay later psychology. This is why the debt ceiling is such an important American institution. It is the only American institution that can impose fiscal discipline on Washington. Because raising the debt ceiling requires a majority in both houses of Congress, the opposition party that controls one of the two houses can use it to wrangle spending cuts or revenue increases from the White House. Fiscal brinksmanship is not always successful. For it to work, a necessary condition is an unpopular president who does not have enough political capital to come out a winner from a protracted showdown. The coming fight over the next few weeks will say much about America's appetite for living within its means. The outcome will tell us much about whether the dollar will retain its dominance over the medium term. Over the past two years, the U.S. decided that it wanted to increase welfare spending, but also fight China. 
but it is clear that it cannot afford both. The upcoming debt ceiling will tell us much about where its priority lies. That is worth finding out for both America's friends and foes. If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come check us out at davidwuunbound.com. Thank you for listening.